I was born in Yemen in 1991, uh, in the southern part, in Aden. Um, I was born to an all, all kind of Sunni family, you know, generations upon generations upon generations of Sunnis. And in fact, we didn't really know much, as a, as a society as a whole, we didn't really know anything other than Sunnism, you know, let alone just my family. Um, I came here when I was around five or six years old, uh, moved to the UK. Um, I live with my parents and my older sister. You know, we grew up in, in a kind of a British society, but with Arab culture. Well, when we came here, I came with my dad because he, my dad and my sister, because he holds a British passport. He's born here, and um, my mom had to wait for her visa and stuff. So, I guess that the thing I remember most about that time was being apart from my mom for ten months. She came ten months after us, and yeah. So my dad had kind of had to juggle work and two kids, you know, we were really young at the time, so it was kind of difficult for us as a, as a family. I think this is, this is a good thing. My family aren't really strict in terms of religion or culture or anything, so it, by giving us that kind of freedom, we were kind of, we came upon Islam kind of at our own will instead of being forced. So, um, like, I was never enforced to wear the hijab. My dad never really put, set us a date where you have to wear hijab after this date. Um, I mean, I, I did wear it, I wore it for a year when I was in year eight or nine. And then I, I think, I didn't really think about it much, so I took it off a year later. But then, um, then I started, you know, kind of being surrounded by more Muslim friends, more hijabi friends. And actually, it was, I think my, my best friend, who's, who's an Iraqi Muslim, had a huge impact in terms of, in terms of the hijab and stuff. So. That kind of that kind of came at, on its own time, and I, I wasn't pressured by my parents or anything, so I didn't feel any sort of force or anything. To be honest, I've never actually I've never actually tr been treated unfairly, or um, you know, by the general British public. You know, as you know, London itself is is very multicultural, and no matter you know how 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 much the media tries to hype up i do feel safe in london i mean i don't i don't feel racially discriminated against or from my religion or anything so i've never actually felt anything islamophobic growing up you know that might have changed now i mean i did i met someone the other day who kind of just screamed in my face saying kind of uh, insulting things about the uh, the prophet and allah but that was like a, literally a one-off. Like I still feel safe in the streets of London and stuff. So I, to be honest, I think I think this man was actually something was wrong with him because he was walking down the street just screaming, and then he just happened to coincidentally, as he was saying the same thing, come across me and my friend. So um, yeah, I just I didn't think any of it, anything of it. Like I didn't really react to it. You can't really say much to someone that's a bit mental. So now I, I, I'm kind of a bit more practicing in a sense. So. Anything I do, anything I say, I understand that by wearing this hijab, I kind of represent the whole of Islam, whether I like it or not. So anything, anything I say, I have to kind of censor. Yeah. On, on social media, I guess there's a sense of self-censorship, you know, because at the end of the day, I am an Arab, I am a Muslim, and I am a female. So anything I say will represent those three categories. So I try as much as I can to keep as kind of Muslim as I can on, on you know, Twitter or Facebook and stuff, because I know at the end of the day it will come back on to Islam. And that's, in this day and age, this is, this is what has destroyed Islam, it's, um, people's representation of it. So, you know, Muslims are not perfect, but Islam is, and I have to kind of at least try to keep it. We, as, you know, Arab Muslims or Arab Muslim females, we kind of, it's been put on us, this, this image of us being chained to the kitchen kind of thing. Um, so I guess speaking out as, as, a, as an Arab Muslim female kind of destroys those barriers and those boundaries. So I think it's much more important for a female Muslim to, to kind of speak out more than... speak out against? Like 
through my poetry, I, I guess. That's how I do it, you know, but there's other means of standing against it. So, like, my poetry has, um, alhamdulillah, has been spread quite a bit around the world, and I, I'm surprised by that as well. But people come up to me and they say, like, this is the first time we see a hijabi woman, you know, like, saying this and that or kind of being the complete opposite to what we 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 were told of you know the traditional arab woman so i think we have to fight that that whole kind of image that we have been forced um that's been forced upon us i go to yemen um on a yearly basis alhamdulillah i'm blessed with that um in yemen i'm kind of you know i feel at home but it's not home cuz and here I'm, I feel at home, but I'm not home, you know, so I guess like, you know, the humans will never be satisfied with anything they get or have. So, like, when I go back there, I, I feel like one, actually one, one person puts it pro like perfectly. He says, um, English, Englishman amongst Arab and an Arab amongst Englishmen. So, um, that's, that's kind of what I feel when I go to Yemen or I'm, when I'm here. When I'm in Yemen, I feel like I need to kind of bring out the English side of me more. When I'm here, I need to bring out the Arab side of me more to kind of balance out the... How are those two sides different from one another? Um, well, when I'm here, I kind of have to stick, stick to my Muslim roots and my Arab culture. So, so like, doing certain things would not be allowed and I totally accept that and I agree with that. Um, in Yemen, maybe speak up a bit more as a female. So that's, that's, that's the main difference, I think. My parents, my parents have instilled religious principles and values in us since you know, a very young age. My mom is very proud that she, um, she got us praying and fasting at the age of five and six. So I can't say they're not religious. I'm just saying that they're not strict. They're not, they're not the type to enforce it upon you if you don't, if you don't want to. You know? it's, it's a thing of understand and practice more more than practice and that's it so um, yeah there you know we are practicing family always have been I live with my my parents and my older sister she's two years older than me um, it's, it's a very small unconventional Arab family um, I guess I'm, I'm most closest to I think my dad because he I think understands me a bit more he supports me much more than everyone else in my whole entire life um, uh, I, the closest like family relatives are all in Yemen, unfortunately. But I do have a lot of family here in London on my mom's side, and we do like see each other on occasions and stuff. But I just don't feel um, a strong, strong connection with, connection with them as I do with those in Yemen. So, my dad and I, I think we get along really well because we are very similar. So um, we're very quiet. So. Um, you know, if we're in a car and it's really quiet, it's okay, it's normal. But if, if I'm quiet in a car with someone else, it'll be like a bit awkward. So I think it's, because it's our similarities that have brought us together. Um, he kind of not lets me do what I want, but accepts that I kind of have to make my own path into things. So with the whole journalism, going into journalism, you know, traveling, anything, he, he's, he's, he trusts me enough to allow me to do that. And um, especially with the poetry as well, you know, most traditional fathers of Arab households aren't really okay with your, you know, daughter getting up on a stage or being on TV or all of those kind of things. But in, 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 that, in that aspect of my life, he's been really supportive and I really, really appreciate that. My dad's daughters are my dad's daughters and no one has a say in that. So, um, I mean, my dad is a very lovable character, so no one can really say anything bad about him. So. You know, we didn't turn out bad, so they can't really say anything. They have no, no proof to say that he done a bad job. I, I completely disagree with that. Um, most of my fam family and friends actually love my dad the most out of you know, all the kind of older men in the generation because he's so lovable and so kind and so generous. So, yeah. When I was in high school and college and stuff, I had a really kind of big circle of friends. We all, you know, went out a lot. It was, you know, mixed genders. I didn't, there was no, like, I mean, of course there were boundaries, but it wasn't a thing of, I can't go out because there's a guy there. It was, it really is like normal, completely normal. Um, when I got to college, like second year, I started wearing hijab, I kind of started, 
like hanging out with a bit more girls, um, Muslim girls and stuff. My, my, my best friend, Noor, she kind of guided me a lot in, in that time of, um, of my life. And I actually think it's all down to her, the fact that I'm here today. I just, I just saw another part of this kind of life. You know, I was very out there and open and stuff. But then I saw like a, a, a bit more conserved kind of community. And I liked that, it attracted me towards it. And um, I just thought like this is, you know, when I compared how these people were with my family in Yemen, I thought this is how I need to be. You know, I can't, I can't, just because I live in Britain or London or whatever, I can't be someone I wasn't born to be. I mean, I, I was definitely in, a, in an Arab community, but I don't think it was the right one. You know, um, there was a lot of things going on that maybe shouldn't have been going on. Like within, you know, like, you know, kids, teens, what they do and stuff, get the trouble, in trouble and running away and all of this kind of stuff. But I didn't really, I wasn't really interested in that kind of atmosphere. And I, I preferred to be a bit more Muslim. I basically write poetry, um, well I first started to write poetry because I felt like um, I needed to address some issues that some people were kind of um, being blind about or being ignorant to and um, my poetry basically focuses on politics more than anything. Um, I started off with politics anyway and recently since, since this whole like um, not conversion but let's say correction of belief, um, I've started um, kind of writing a bit more religiously. I have some 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 poems which kind of are directed towards the Bayt, you know, and injustice that happened in Karbala and stuff. And um, since 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 that happened, I think I kind of um, I I see the link between politics and religion more clearly now than ever. And um, I can't kind of talk about politics and injustice in this day in this day and age without kind of talking about it in the historical sense. I feel like I feel like we should all, you know, whether we are journalists or poets or scientists, whatever you want to you want to do, I think we should all come together and um, address the issues of you know historical injustice and today's injustice. Because at the end of the day, um, if if you don't want to do it for yourself. Then you do it for your um, brothers and sisters. If you don't want to do it for that, then you do it for you know the the awaited imam who will at some point return and he will need people of um, of all sectors of society, of all levels of society to kind of back him and his army and stuff. So that's basically what has what pushes me and motivates me now to write poetry. <laughs> The next poem I actually wrote um, a few, maybe two months ago or so, and I released it with a campaign called Support Yemen. They're an organisation that are, you know, basically trying to raise awareness for issues in Yemen. And one of their campaigns was to um, raise awareness on um, women issues, you know, domestic uh, domestic abuse and all of that kind of stuff. So I thought it would be the, um, best to kind of um, release this poem with them and to help them out a bit. So this one is called Pieces. And it's a true story, by the way, which is why I've, um, I've decided to address it. I sit face down with my head in my arms while a pool of tears is flowing in my palms. I'm listening to cries being thrown around and the cries around me are, and the walls around me are echoing the sound, making it twice as loud and twice as frightening. Conflict is building up like thunder and lightning. I'm only seven years old and I hear her cries. I see her tears in the darkest of nights and every time his voice is raised, I want to punch his face. I want to hold her close and leave this place and my heart breaks any time I see her face in my mind. In my mind, I've killed him a thousand times and I've injected him with the pain that I see in her eyes. How could an angel so pure become a victim of the devil? I'm frozen in time, but my mind never settles. They tell me my mother was a victim of love and she fell for a man she knew nothing of. She was blinded for the man who awoke in her heart and left the family for the man who would tear them apart. Grandma told her, baby, don't go, please just stay. She said, mama, please leave me, I don't feel no pain. I'm in love with this man, he's no stranger to me. And without her parents' blessings, she got, he got down on one knee. She accepted without consent, and with him she ran. With a killer, I later found myself calling dad. 
I don't know how he man managed, but he brainwashed an angel. And with the goodness of her heart, the devil was able to control her feelings and control her head. Who, what she thought was love, left her scarred and dead. Emotionally first, he suppressed and degraded her. And she never fought back, because that's not the way her parents raised her. I can't help but think patience killed my mother. And now I'm impatient to kill my mother's lover. I'm calling out to you, but the screams never reaches. Mother, may your soul rest in peace as my heart lives in pieces. Thank you very much. Um, I started writing at a really, really young age. I guess it was that period of time where we came to Britain and my mum wasn't there. So I just kind of wrote, it, wrote everything down. Um, it kind of developed over the years. Obviously, it started on, on like minor city things, you know, like, I don't know. And then it started getting into a bit, a bit, more, a bit more deeper, eventually kind of reached politics. And that's kind of where I'm at right now, politics and religion. Were you writing in English or not? Yeah, I write, I write in English. I tried, I tried doing a bit of Arabic, but it's obviously my, voc my vocab is a bit more limited in, in Arabic, so I kind of focus more on English now. The majority of the time, I think I just kept it secret. I just, it was just something that I did. It wasn't like, you know, I need to show someone. But over the years, I think I started showing my friends a bit more. And the, the response I got from them was, quite good most of the time. So that kind of motivate, motivated me to do more, write more, and over the years I just started, I just started doing that exactly, and came a period of time where I thought maybe I should get this published somewhere, not you know in a book or anything, but online or anything. But I think I was kind of scared of putting it online, um, mainly because I was really self-conscious, and you know, I didn't think it was good enough, and, and then, I just kind of pushed myself and put it up. Um, first time, I, I, just, I just used to, because I have this thing where I'm kind of scared that um, if I write a poem and I put it up, it might be kind of taken out of context or something. So what I did was um, I worked around that and I, I recorded all of them on audio and then um, I put them up as a video on YouTube so it can't ever be changed unless you edit it. Um, so I put that up and then I, um, I added the lyrics to it as you know, t text on my blogs and stuff. So that's how it's been going on for now. I think the beginning was more like whenever I'm angry, I write. You know, whatever has angered me at that time, I write about it. So um, you can, as, if you read my, all my old stuff, which is not public, um, it's a bit more angry. It's a bit more like, it doesn't flow as well. Um, because it was written out of anger. Um, I kind of used to write a lot about friendships and stuff. I guess most of the times I felt like I wasn't understood, you know, by friends or family or whatever. So the only place that I could be understood is on paper. So I wrote that. When I got to college time-ish, I think I was introduced to a bit more like of a hip hop political kind of music scene. So um, through that, I kind of saw it as poetry more than music, to be honest. Um, I kind of, I was influenced a lot by, you know, people like Loki and um, others in, in the scene. So that kind of opened my eyes a bit more because he has a lot of knowledge in his songs. And um, from, from, from listening to a song, I kind of knew a bit more about something. And then I'd go on to research it a bit more. And then that, I gained a lot of knowledge. So I thought this was the right way to kind of get your message across. So I started doing the same thing, really. And hopefully it works political issues was probably Palestine. That was like the most, the biggest in, in that time as well. Um, and I think like the whole representation of is, is, is Islam, so Islamophobia, you know, war on terror, that kind of stuff. I mean, obviously Palestine has, has been an issue for all of us since a very young age. You know, we've been taught about it for years and years, even before, you know, switching the TV on. But I guess the whole injustice of it, you know, the fact that it's been ignored for so long, it's been 64 years now. Um, I think it was just, it was something that it was so obviously one-sided that I, don't, I didn't understand how anyone could see any other way of it. So that, that, that's what kind of got me. To be honest, I haven't actually written a lot about Palestine. I mean, there, there are some stuff in my, you know, my folders or whatever that 
that may have mentioned or something Palestine but there's I don't really like write a lot about it but it's just the fact that Palestine kind of opened my eyes to the rest of the politics of the world so I can't say I, I you know I'm I'm a voice of Palestine because I haven't done enough to be a voice of Palestine but um, it did definitely open my eyes the Arab Spring I guess for everyone not just you know me but for everyone it was kind of a new sign of hope um, in in the will of the people um, you know we've been kind of we've been constricted for so long as you know a people we've, we've had dictators for nearly all our lives all of my life and no one ever really spoke out against it so whenever every time I go to Yemen and I see you know pictures of Ali Abdullah Saleh everywhere I just think and, and at the same time hear all the stories of people that are you know, talking bad of him, I just think like, well, do something. Why can't we do something about it? Are we ever going to do something about it? So when the when the Arab Spring came, especially for for Yemen, it was a huge shock to me, um, and especially seeing you know women on the front lines of of Sanaa and Adan and other places in in Yemen. But as as a poet, I guess it kind of fired me up a bit. You know, um, I, I I had had a sudden kind of flare and I wanted to write more and I wanted to do more and I wanted to be more involved, you know, not just as a poet, not just through my poetry, but, you know, through a bit of activism, through online uh, social media and stuff. I wanted to kind of spread the message as far and help as much as I can. So um, that's, yeah, that's how it helped. At first it was really, really exciting and at the same time very overwhelming. Like, it was, it was just a clash of emotions. Like, I didn't know what to think or what to do, what to say. Like. I remember we would be in, in lectures and everyone would be, you know, doing the studies or whatever. And me and my friend who also is on the kind of the same, um, has the same interest as me, we would just be on, you know, on online trying to figure out what's happened next. Because it was literally minute by minute updates, you know, especially from Egypt. So when, when that kind of fired up, everyone is just so hyped up and excited and active. And I really, I really like that, you know. It showed that the, co the community can come together and can kind of, help one another. The whole situation in Yemen, as I said, really fired me up. I was so surprised because, you know, we're known to be the kind of laid back Arabs, you know, that we're not really political. Um, but when I, when I saw like millions out on the streets, you know, demanding freedom and something that, it's, it's not something that I ever seen in my life from Yemenis. And um, I mean, obviously it, it was a defining moment in history and I kind of, I realised that as it was going along, I didn't really realise at the beginning. And then, um, you know, it took, it took nearly a whole year for Ali Abdullah Saleh to leave Yemen. And to be honest, that kind of surprised everyone. It kind of showed his kind of, um, it showed his sly but smart moves as a politician. He was, um, he was described to be the most kind of tactical in the whole, you know, the whole spring. And you know he did last a very long time, surprisingly. But I don't think there ever came a moment of me kind of losing faith in the revolution. I mean, I knew that once, once you know, they were, the people were past that kind of fear. Once they break that down, it's not stopping them. And as well, like too many, too many martyrs have fallen for us to just say, okay, okay, let's just forget it and go back to life. Like it wasn't going to happen until he's gone. But even then. Like now, I, I do kind of feel like desensitized by it. You know, I'm I'm you know I'm I'm well aware of the 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 Western kind of influence over Yemen, especially. You know, so I don't think there will be change. Not the change that we want to see, anyway. I mean, you know, Tawakkul Karman, who was who was um, who won the Nobel Peace Prize, she was the first Yemeni Arab woman Muslim. To win the to to win the Nobel Peace Prize, that was something that kind of got me really emotional, and everyone around me like that day in Yemen was kind of like Eid, and um, it was it was nice to see that that the the image of female Yemeni women was you know demolished completely by that one face, but over the, over the few months she's been kind of <clears throat> she's been working closely with the U.S. And that, that's kind of lost, I've lost a bit of hope in her because I know 
you know, when the West gets close to someone, they're kind of grooming them to, for further political kind of interests and stuff. So I wouldn't be surprised if in a few years' time she would be the next, next president, and I wouldn't really support that, you know, because of her relationship with the US. Politics has, over the past year, you know, and I'm not just saying this from, you know, the politics I've been reading on, but also the religion I've been reading on, um, it's all kind of come together for me and everything just kind of fell into place and everything is a bit more clear to me now. So um, I've kind of been reading up on a lot of the, a lot of history, both Islamic and, you know, polit political history, you know, US kind of, um, coups and stuff that's happened over the past years and I've seen a, a, a similar kind of pattern. So I'm, I'm now at a stage where I, I of course support freedom and revolution and stuff and that, uh, but I still know that it won't happen in this way and I'm well aware of you know, the, the tactics that are being used by Western powers in, in the region and I, I know their interest in the region as well. So I kind of try to challenge the political kind of mindset of people, or the media, I should say. Like, I have, I have this very strong opinion on the media and its, uh, its partiality and stuff. Um, so everything I write kind of comes back to the media. So, for example, I have, I have a poem called Mr. BMP, which kind of, you know, we were introduced on as Muslims through the media, you know, no one actually really came up to us and talked and stuff, but the, the destruction of the Muslims came through the media and the lens. So um, obviously that's what people like the BNP and the EDL see of us, they don't know us in, you know, face to face by nature personally. So I have a poem that's um, called Mr. BNP and it kind of challenges, challenges their ideologies and policies against Muslims. And that, that's been, I think, one of my favourite ones. I have a few things to say. Did you know that Brits live on my land to this day? 1832, that's when they first entered and occupied my land. That's when they first took over and colonised Yemen. They were born there. They grew up and lived for 132 years. And you ask me, Mr Smith, you ask me what rights I have being here. See, I don't understand. All the money I earn goes back into your hands, your pocket. They call it tax, but it's just theft made legal. It's shocking. Why do you hate me? Why do you try to provoke me? Is it the hijab on my head? The jilbab I wear or the scarf around my neck? Is it my father's facial hair? It is, isn't it? That's why you all stare. You're scared. I'll tell you what, I'll wear my hijab. I'll risk it. Because regardless, I'm more British than your tea and biscuits. See, I didn't steal your job, Mr. BMP. Your job looked at you and it came to me. See, I went to school and I got an education. In fact, my main goal in life has always been elevation. I mean, come on, my uncles don't run every company in the city. I got the job based on the content of my CV. You want us out? Okay, excuse me, please. While I take our kebab shops, curry houses, shisha cafes, Mediterranean cuisines. You say we broke Britain? Actually, we gave it structure. If anything, you should thank me for giving Britain the culture. However, I guess we have one thing in common. I too strongly condemn attacks and bombings. I too fear for my life when I get on a train and when I heard of 9-11, I too felt pain. You may think I'm your enemy, Mr. BMP, but I suggest you look in the mirror before you judge me. I've always been surrounded by um, Shias or Shia Islam, um, but I never really gave it enough focus or attention to look into it. You know, I, I really I wasn't really interested in it to be honest. I just thought saw them as another type of Muslims with, you know, similar beliefs. Obviously, I did hear of some, you know, supposed beliefs of the Shia or, the, or ideologies that come from people who don't who don't really know much about religion. Um, but I guess, I guess um, I just came through it out of research more than anything. Um, I was never forced to pick up any of the um, beliefs. I was never, it was never forced down me by, you know, my friends who were mostly Shia. They never kind of took me to the side and said, you know, 
any condescending comments or, you know, sister, you're misguided or any of those kind of stuff. And that was something that attracted me towards it. I think it was a um, reverse psychology that worked with me. Although I'm, I'm sure none, none of them actually tried to do it in that way. Um, a few, I think it was maybe a year or two ago, two years ago in Muharram, um, I was, we were all sitting down, you know, a, 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 the friends were sitting down and one of my friends who's really, really, really spiritual, especially in terms of Muharram, he kind of sat down, he told us about all his emotions that happened, especially on the, the night of Ashura and stuff, and I never really understood it. So we kind of asked him to tell us the story, and he did, and he, um, he explained it. In not, obviously, at the time it was brief, but it was more than I ever knew. Um, so it was the first time that I heard about you know, the, the intercepted journey to Kufa. It was the first time I heard about, you know, the children screaming in tents, the burning of the tents, the first uh, Abbas and his sever, severed hands. All, all of these things were just new to me. Even Yazid and Muawiyah and the conflict with the Prophet's family, it was all new to me. And I was just thinking, like, why don't I know this as a Muslim of 20 years? And so that poked me to do a bit more research and I started reading books. If I can't find books and I find them online, if I can't do that, then I listen to lectures. When I listen to lectures, um, I write, note down anything that I need to research more on, do that, come back to lectures, understand everything. So I need, I, I just, it just a whole year of kind of research into this. And um, yeah, so I guess when, when, when I saw everything for myself, I couldn't really deny it, you know? Like, I, and I understood that I was kind of, you know, my, my intention was never to convert it as such. It was just to understand. And um, that's why I kind of say I stumbled upon the path of Ahdul Bayt. Like, it was an accidental thing, but it was a, the best thing that happened to me. Um, everything started making sense. I couldn't deny any of the things that were taught to me. You know, people sometimes say, oh, she's been brainwashed. She's around a lot of Shias. No one has ever spoken to me about it. Like, I can't stress that enough. No one's ever tried to enforce it on me. It was just purely out of my own research, you know. Some hadith seemed a bit, like, exaggerated to me, but when I looked into it, you know, they do exist. Um, and most of them are in Sunni Sahih books, which is really important to understand. Like, when, when someone asks you to prove something and you give them your own book, it doesn't really mean much, you know, because it's your own, your own book. But if you, if, if, if you prove it through their own works, then that's, that gives it a bit more ground. And that's, where, that's, that's what kind of interested, interested me a lot. The first thing I've experienced in terms of, you know, Shia uh, traditions or, um, you know, the way of life was, a f I can't remember how many years ago, but it's quite a long time ago. And um, my friends kind of invited me to a lecture in a hall during the time of Muharram. And I, um, I just, I, I never knew what it was. I just knew that, you know, during this time they go to a lot of lectures in, in their own mosques or whatever. So I went there and I was a bit nervous. But that, that kind of point of my life was really interesting because it kind of highlighted my own ignorance for me. Um, so we were sitting in a lecture and, you know, the lecture was reasonable, it was really good. Um, it could be understood by anyone, regardless of Muslim or not. It wasn't really, um, you know, anything that at the time I've heard of the Shia, you know, it wasn't anything fanatical or anything. So um, I was listening to the lecture and I was thinking, yeah, this is not bad. And then suddenly the Imam or the speaker was replaced by someone who came and started doing some sort of singing to me what it was. And obviously I've never actually heard of um, that kind of singing for eulogies or Lakmiyas. Um, and it just sounded really beautiful to me, but I didn't, I didn't know what it was. But I just, the, the voice and the words and everything was beautiful. And then everyone's kind of stood up and they started tapping their chest. Like just in slow motion, like it wasn't, nothing extreme, nothing fanatical. But obviously me, because I've never actually seen this before, it's never, I've never experienced it before. It was completely new to me, even though it was in no way intimidating, I was intimidated by it. And that was because I wasn't familiar with it. So it was fear of the unknown, which is um, something that over the past year I've realized is kind of the core reason for the um, like the division in the Ummah. So 
because of because people fear the idea of the Shia, you know, the whole concept of Shia, they don't want to look into it. They're intimidated by it. So that was for me, um, I wouldn't say a turning point. I mean, then it wasn't a turning point, but looking, at, looking back now, I kind of see my own ignorance. As I said, I came from a Sunni family. Everyone in Yemen, well, the majority of Yemenis are Sunnis, but in the culture that I was living in and stuff, we never really knew about Shia. Like, I went to Yemen two years ago and I was talking to my, my cousin about it, and she's like, what's Shia, to that extent. So um, obviously when I came here, I was a bit surprised to see there were other types of Muslims and stuff, so, and I, I never really, I knew they were there. I never approached them or spoke about it. Um, so I didn't really, I didn't feel the need to um, kind of inquire or anything. It wasn't interesting to me. I just knew that they were Muslims and whatever. Um, obviously I've heard of misconceptions, you know, all of these crazy stories that I've found to be completely false and fabricated. So, but I never, I never actually, I can't say I felt any sort of hatred or prejudice against the Shias even before. The, the main book that kind of sealed the deal for me was Then I Was Guided. And a lot of people say that when, when they are talking about Shia and stuff. Because that, that book kind of showed me how to prove the Shia beliefs through Sunni, method, through Sunni resources. And that, like when I read that, I was think I literally read it in a day. Like that's how inter into it into it I was, and I was like, that's it. Like I can't, you can't deny it. Like all, all it's not like these hadith are, you know, come out coming out of nowhere. They're coming out of Sahih books. So that for me was like the main kind of thing. Other than that, I was on, um, like Islamic sites online, and obviously, I would go to Shia websites as opposed to you know, people who hate the Shia websites. I remember once on Twitter, I must have said something and someone replied to me and said, Sister, you're misguided, gave me a, a link. And I clicked on the link and the website was called shiabs.com and we know what BS stands for. So I was thinking like, if you want to approach people, do not do it in a way that will send them running away from you. So, you know, there's, there's ways to approach people. And it's just people like that when they come they tell me something about someone and they give you a link from someone that hates that someone. It's just like that to me. I'm like, that's not credible for me. So I had to go through, you know, to the source of it and find the information from there. And when I did, it kind of made sense to me. My friend recommended this book and then um, I saw her and she gave it to me. And then I read it and I started like, because, because of his, because of the Sayyid's use of like, a hadith that came from Sunni books, it got me really into it. I was like, if these hadith are in Sunni books, then why have they been overlooked? Um, so I just sat there reading the whole day. I literally blocked out the whole world, my family, everyone, and I just sat there reading. It didn't take as long as I expected. Um, and it just kind of, everything made so much sense. To me, this was a kind of, it was all based on logic. Uh, rather than emotion, you know, um, I could I could be arrogant about it and say, you know, I could be arrogant and pride uh, and proud and say that, okay, I've I read this, and I know it's true, but I'm not going to do it because, because I can't say that I was wrong this whole, all my t all my life. But um, like when you, when you're searching for some for the truth, you have to let go of pride and arrogance, and you have to accept the truth, even if it's swimming against the, the tides of, you know, social conformity or family traditions or anything. It was, I kind of read it, I mean, I can't say I, I convert, firstly, I don't like that word converted, because, you know, I'm still a Muslim and I wasn't Muslim. But um, it's just a thing of, that kind of pushed me deeper into it. So I, I didn't stop researching, I haven't stopped researching till now. And um, the day I converted, as you say, was the day I kind of, I knew, I knew this was the right thing for me. It wasn't, it wasn't the same day I read the, read the book, but it was a few months after. I was, I was like, this is it, this is, this is for me. And then um, I was actually doing a skydive on the same day. So I kind of, instead of screaming down 10,000 feet, I kind of pledged allegiance. And then I, I shouted the names of all the holy names as I was like falling from the sky. And that was kind of, 
That was the day I think just all, it just changed my life. Um, no, I don't. I don't believe I was chosen to be guided. I I strongly believe that um, those who want to be guided will be guided. You know, um, it's not a thing where Allah chooses one person and says no to the other. That that doesn't make sense. You know, on the day of judgment, day of judgment, you can just say, well, you didn't choose me to be guided. So it's 100% an individual thing, and I think we have to, no matter how much it might hurt our pride, read into it. No matter how much like it might kill you inside to do it, you have to do it. It's um, ignorance. Every single time of ignorance will be questioned as well on the day of judgment, and you know, time is ticking. No one can really say it's changed how I am with them. Like, my friends can't say, oh, she's a Shia now. Mm. Like, nothing has changed between me and my friends and stuff. But internally, it has changed me. Like, for example, now I understand the world a bit more. You know, it might sound crazy, but I think politics and religion are very closely combined, can, can be combined. And um, because I understood religion, I now understand the politics of today. So um, I, think, I think Islamic history is pivotal in understanding 21st century Islam. I strongly, strongly believe, you can call me crazy for this, but you know, the army of Yazid and you know, the enemies of the Prophet are still working today, are still propagating today. Yeah, over, over the past few months, um, I've actually, I've noticed that I, I have no more motivation to write about politics as I did before. Now it's mostly about personal kind of experiences and the Ahlul Bayt as well, I've written some, a few on that. Um, but I haven't actually pushed them out as much because I feel, I don't know, I feel a bit nervous to do so. Firstly that, again, I'm kind of conscious that are they, will they live up to, you know, those kind of standards. Also, I don't want people to see me as a Shia Muslim. You know, I want them to see me as a Muslim before Shia. So, um, I, I think if if I was to put up a bit more Shia-fied um, like poems, people might kind of switch off, and I don't want them to switch off just yet. I want them to. I want to go around it, you know, from the back way, and then kind of. Uh, one of the main things that pulled me in a bit deeper was the, the hadith of the two weighty things, which clearly states that the, the two weighty things are the Qur'an and the Ahlul Bayt. And, you know, this is mentioned in Sahih books as well. So for me, I was just thinking, if, you, if you're told, if you're demanded to follow the Qur'an and the Ahlul Bayt, why else would, they, would there be any need for anything else? Like, why would I need to go to someone else or another companion, you know? As, as righteous as they may be or anything, I was told to go through the Qur'an and the Ahlul Bayt and that's what I'm doing now. What I will hope to do in the future is hopefully, firstly, become a voice of um, the oppressed. You know, whether that happens through my poetry or through my journalism work, it will happen, inshallah. Um, I hope to kind of um, shed light on a few of the oppressions that we that we as Muslims face, you know, both here and um, all the people struggling in, in the third world, as they call it. Um, you know, after, after finding out the story of Karbala and stuff, I kind of have no choice but to stand up against injustice, and that's why I hope to do. With every tick of the clock, our lifetimes separate. O oh, tears of sorrow to him rise, evaporate. Speak to him of broken smiles, take me to him, levitate. Tears still my words, listen to them paraphrase. Tears still my words, listen to them paraphrase. Why did you leave? Oh rainfall, don't add to this surrounding puddle. I'm drowning in my tears and these tears, oh how subtle they're able to crush humans, transform us into rubble. I'm retracing your tracks, unable I fall and stumble. Where are you? The ice swell at the glimpse of your image. Once the story starts, the tears never finish. Absence destroys the heart and the soul is diminished. Your absence destroyed this heart and this soul is diminished. When will you return? When will you return? When will you